book, The Ottomans, A Cultural Legacy. Diana Dark is a Middle East cultural expert with a special focus on Syria. She has an undergraduate and MA degree in Arabic from Oxford University and her MA in Islamic Art and Architecture from SOAS London. She has spent over 35 years specializing in the Middle East, working for both government and commercial sectors. She lived in Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Oman, and Dubai, and authored 15 detailed guides to the region, including some for Turkey, North Cyprus, and Syria. Among her publications are the highly acclaimed My House in Damascus, an inside view of the Syrian crisis, which was published in 2016, The Merchant of Syria, um, in, uh, published in 2018, and The Last Sanctuary in Aleppo, which was published in 2019. Her book, Stealing from the Saracens, How Islamic Architecture Shaped Europe, which was published in 2020, received three Book of the Year um, awards in 2020. Diane frequently appears at international events and in media, and she is also a non-resident scholar at the Middle East um, Institute, Institute. Her most recent book, The Ottomans, A Cultural Legacy, oh, was published in the UK in September, 2022. And today we are celebrating its launch in the, um, in the US. Without further ado, let me um, give the floor to Diana to tell us about her new, new book, The Ottomans. After her presentation, we will have some time for discussion. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions through the Q&A function of the Zoom. Diana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you very much indeed for hosting this for Middle East Institute. I, I am myself a non-resident scholar in the Syria program here. So it's wonderful to be able to join across the Atlantic for events like this. And I, I really, really appreciate that. And uh, obviously the reason that this book has come out now is because it's been a hundred years since the demise of the Ottomans. And almost always the focus with the Ottomans is on the final bloody messy decades, uh, the, the, the run up to the World, World War I and, and the absolute catastrophes that took place then. And that has colored our image uh, of the Ottomans. And so the reason I wanted to take this book on, and it's a, a massive complex subject, my goodness, you know, we're talking about an empire that lasted 600 years across uh, three continents, you know, 72 different nationalities. I mean, I mean, ethnicities, sorry, <laughs> using the language of today rather than then, and 12 different languages. So it's a, an absolutely vast subject, which is why I think um, nobody's taken it on before, frankly, to do such a broad sweep of the cultural legacy. Um, and although there are many uh, learned books uh, about the Ottomans, uh, they each tend to focus on one area or other. And then, and then you get this sort of fragmentation of knowledge. So this book is designed to bring all those pieces of knowledge together, if you like, and to present for a, for a general audience an overview of the Ottoman cultural legacy. Uh, yeah. So the book focuses uh, to a large extent, more than most other publications, um, on the early stages, on the origins, because again, I think this is just not known about enough. Everybody talks about Suleiman the Magnificent and all the sort of harem adventures and this kind of thing. And again, this has colored our view of the Ottomans. And so uh, I want to show you this map of Anatolia in, in 1300, because uh, 1299 is, is when Osman, the founder of the Ottomans, uh, founded the, the very, the, his state, if you like. And, and this was the most cosmopolitan state in the world. It's worth remembering that. And just to give a bit of historical context, uh, Osman and his tribe, he led his tribe from, uh, or his father to be precise, had led the tribe across from the east where they were escaping the Mongols. I mean, they, they were uh, nomadic tribesmen with, with herds of, of sheep and uh, they were looking for grazing and they were constantly being chased out of the Eurasian steppes by the Mongol advance. 
And the only safe direction to keep moving away from the Mongols was westwards towards the weakening Byzantine Empire. And so uh, Syria, um, uh, Turkey was, was, was fragmented into many uh, different Turkish uh, tribes with different tribal leaders, Beyliks they were called, and Osmans was the one that, that managed against all the odds to form a state. And of course, it's all about personalities with this, uh, with when you have things like this, where one family has been responsible for setting up an entire state that lasts 600 years, personalities have a huge uh, role to play. And Osman himself was a very fierce uh, warrior, extremely clever. Um, and he understood, he had ambitions to found a state right from the beginning. And he understood that, that he, as, as a tribesman, needed the skills of other people in order to develop the state. Uh, he, he recognized that they lacked many, many, uh, much experience of trading and, uh, you know, cultural aspects. So he, he, he welcomed everybody who was prepared to join him, really, to set up a new, a new state. And the glue of, of the state that he founded was commerce. And it, this is so important to realize that the Ottoman Empire was, was really one huge common market, one huge single market. And when maps uh, of the Ottoman Empire show boundaries, those are purely administrative boundaries for the purposes of uh, taxation. Because what, uh, what the Ottomans believed was that you had to found um, an egalitarian state for, from the bottom up where you helped the poorest um, to become prosperous. And then you took as much tax from them as they could afford, um, but only as much as they could afford. So if there was a drought or a famine, you reduced the taxes to, to account for that. And in order to facilitate the trade across the entire empire, they built these caravanserais, which they inherited from the Seljuks before then where um, merchants could stay for three nights uh, free of charge. And uh, so, so these, um, the, the first capital um, where you can see this, this kind of um, ethos, if you like, in action is Bursa. The first Ottoman capital was Bursa. And this was on, in land that um, Osman had been granted by the, the Seljuk Sultan for his help in, in fighting against the Mongols. And here in Bursa, which has been recognized by UNESCO as a world, character, a world um, heritage site um, for its, its unique uh, urban planning, basically a bottom up approach where you have at the center there, you've got the, the, the main mosque, the great mosque, the Ulujana, and then all around it, you have the caravanserais, the baths, the hospitals, the soup kitchens. It's like a huge community hub that offers everything to everybody, irrespective of religion or ethnicity. And so everybody can benefit and, and um, get these services free of charge. And then, of course, um, that draws people in. It um, makes residential areas increase and, and spreads prosperity to everybody. And one of the, uh, one of the innovations uh, at, at Bursa that the Ottomans began was having these villages in the hills around, seven villages. Uh, uh, Osman and his sons were, were granted one of these villages um, each, and, and then the, they would, um, uh, you know, it was very fertile agricultural land, and so all their produce would be sent into market and the profits from that would go into the community hub. So the whole thing was self-sustaining um, and, and these services were, were provided then by, by the state. This, this one at uh, Jumali uh, Kuzuk is actually still, still looks like, like a medieval town. I mean, the cobbles, everything is there. I mean, and again, this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site that's been pre preserved. Very, very few people know about it or visit it though. In, in Borsa, the thing it became most famous for was silk. And this is the Silk Bazaar, which is also still there. And the silk um, products uh, ranged hugely. I mean, a, a massive silk industry built up in Borsa. 
uh, carpets and garments and you know garments worn by everybody not just by the sultan but by um you know orthodox uh, church vestments of priests for example i mean it was it was a sign of huge prestige and so um european royalty wanted to be dressed in in bursa silks and so uh you you get uh, a massive silk industry building up and of course uh, carpets is one of the uh, major areas of Ottoman uh, handicrafts if you like that um, it's actually my favorite part of the book to, um, where I, I wrote a chapter called um, Ottoman the Ottoman aesthetic sense and it's all based on on carpets and it looks at the the nomadic origins and the closeness to nature and, and all the use of symbolism and, and the use of colors. It's, it's a fascinating uh, subject to become involved in. And in, in my view, the, the Ottoman ethos is very much reflected in their carpets. So by, by, uh, by uh, af after about 50 years or more, um, the Ottoman Empire had expanded into mainland Europe. And the second capital um, became uh, Edirne, which is on the European mainland, a Adrianople, it's also known as. And you'll see from this map how the empire began to expand up around the Black Sea. And this is quite interesting for what's happening today with Russia and Crimea, because again, people forget that, that Crimea and, and Ukraine were actually parts of the Ottoman Empire. Kodalia there is, um, is in what is modern Ukraine. And uh, uh, the, for the same, uh, the reason that these areas became lost to the Ottoman Empire was the same reason as today that Russia had um, an imperialist agenda and started to want to expand basically. Um, and so initiated wars into these areas, creating massive waves of refugees who were mainly Muslim, who, who were then taken in by the Ottomans. Uh, so, so it's interesting to reflect on the, on the geography as it was then and consider it now. So Edirne, the second capital, uh, stayed that way for, for about nearly 100 years, it was the second capital. And you start to see here this very unique style of Ottoman architecture evolving, unlike anything that's been seen before. And this in Edirne is, is the, the Sultan's palace with this panoramic uh, viewpoint at the top, which is like a sort of tent. The, the Ottoman uh, nomadic tents were always round and, and conical like that. So this is like a sort of tent perched up high with a huge water feature in the center that, that runs all the way down. It's quite unlike anything else. And in Edirne, you, st you still have um, the remnants then of the kind of society that the Ottomans set up. So this is the synagogue in Edirne, which is still functioning, obviously. And um, it reminds us of the Ottoman approach to refugees, which was basically everybody is welcome. It doesn't matter what religion, what ethnicity. And so in, in, uh, the, in Spain and, and Portugal at the time of the Reconquista, when, when the Catholic um, monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, were, were kicking out all their, their Jews and their Muslims, uh, the, um, the Ottoman Sultan sent ships to collect them and said, come, come to us, we will protect you. And indeed they, they were, I mean, the, the largest, um, one of the largest communities of, uh, of, of Jews outside Israel is still, is still actually in, um, in Istanbul to this day. And uh, this is just a, a quick reminder of um, Constantinople itself, how it was weakened um, by the by Christianity <laughs> it, itself, if you like, I mean the fourth, the disastrous fourth crusade in 1204, which set off supposedly to the Holy Land and then got diverted to Constantinople, where it attacked the Orthodox, uh, the, the Greek Orthodox um, uh, city, and and looted it and pillaged it and and took took everything back to Venice and you know many treasuries all over. Europe are full of things that were pillaged from Constantinople there. So, so it was very much a weakened city um, at the time that, um, that Mehmet the Conqueror was, uh, was able to take it. 
but this this whole um, inclusiveness uh, where where the patriarch and and the the Jewish the Jewish leader I mean all, all of these things are very well represented in in the artworks and uh, this again is an illustration of uh, the, the the Reconquista what was happening there there's the sort of the 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 kind of mentality, if you like, of, of this is um, Santiago de Compostela, the, um, Santiago Matamores, he was known as the killer of the Moors. And so in European um, art, you, you start to get images like this of, of, of him sort of dressed, St. James dressed, uh, sort of killing, killing, um, uh, you know, the, the Moor as, as he was known, or Saracens. Um, and, and so, all these, uh, so many persecuted people, uh, Jews, Muslims, and indeed Christians, because uh, a lot of persecution of, of, of Christians was also happening, uh, all found refuge in, in the Ottoman Empire. I mean, to, to, to become an Ottoman was a sought after thing. If you, if you, if you were a minority, then within the, the Ottoman Empire, you would be protected. The state was not concerned about what what ethnicity or religion you, you were, um, as long as you paid your taxes, um, you would be looked after, that that was the deal basically. And so Mehmed the Conqueror represented here, when he took uh, Constantinople, uh, he, which was always referred to as the red apple, the, 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 the most delicious sort of wonderful thing you could imagine, um, uh, was had been the aspiration from from a very early time to be able to take Constantinople. And it's worth remembering that he was an exceptionally educated man. He was trilingual, he was a brilliant uh, strategist. And um, when his army took Constantinople, it wasn't some sort of marauding Muslim horde from, 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 uh, from the central Asian steppes. It was from the European mainland with a mixed army of Muslims and Christians. It's, it's worth stressing this, uh, you know, this, this aspect of uh, things are not black and white at all. You know, the Disney version of, of history where you've got a sort of noble Chris, Christian Europe fighting against a despotic Muslim Orient is very much the sort of Disney version. And even, even in the, the, the Second Siege of Vienna, a hundred thousand Hungarian Christians fought on the Ottoman side, as did thousands of Greeks, Armenians, Slavs, and Transylvanian Protestants, who were disenchanted with the Catholic fervor of, of the Habsburgs. So it's important to, to, to realize these things. And so the, the geography matters here, because I mean, this, this is an, a satellite view of the Bosphorus, uh, which in our mind is the division between Europe and Asia. But Ottomans didn't think like that. I mean, they had no, no sense of the division between, between uh, Europe and, and Asia. And 25% and of their empire was in Europe for, for well over a century. Um, and so whereas we in, in the West have tended to think of uh, you know, the, the sort of block, if you like, of, of, of what we think of as, as Turkey today as either a sort of um, uh, a bridge or, or a sponge to absorb any sort of chaotic things that are happening. I mean, the Ottomans did not think of themselves as a bridge or a sponge. Uh, it was a very, a very different mentality. And so once they had Constantinople, um, they they, again, their unique form of architecture, the, the, the palace that Mehmet II built, um, the top carpi, is unlike anything else in Europe. It is discreet, it is low rise, and it extends over a, a large area and is thought to represent the, um, the style, actually, of a nomadic encampment where you move through courtyards, uh, through, through rings of tents, if you like, that are arranged in a sort of courtyard fashion into where the Sultan himself is in the most protected place. And this is an aerial view of the top copy in a, in a Turkish uh, Ottoman miniature that again shows the way the Ottomans uh, did this kind of bird's eye view of, of um, uh, of, of, of landscapes and, and maps. And you can see how it's set in gardens. Everywhere is, is gardens. 
And gardens and flowers, and you will notice Mehmet was sniffing a flower. I mean, flowers are deeply embedded in, in Ottoman culture. And, and the tulip became the, the Ottoman symbol. Uh, and uh, of course, tulip mania then took hold in, in, in Europe in the 17th century. It was thought to be the first sort of bursting of an asset bubble when, um, when the, the, the market had gone completely crazy. And, and in this um, French painting, uh, a Dutchman is guarding one very, very valuable bulb, tulip bulb, while, while the rest of the soldiers are trying to destroy the rest of the, uh, uh, the, rest of the crop, if you like. But um, so uh, tulips everywhere. Um, Mehmet planted them uh, all over his, uh, in, the, in the parks and gardens that he um, asked to, to be uh, created in uh, all over the, the, new, the new capital of Topkapi. And he himself worked in the gardens uh, uh, for leisure, for recreation and relaxation. He, he would work um, in, in the gardens himself. And here are the kitchens, the incredible kitchens of the Topkapi Palace where there were over 60 chefs, um, massive uh, recruitment drives to, to find the best chefs. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's quite current really today on this sort of the TV programs we have about, you know, all these uh, competitions to have the best, the best, uh, the best cooks. Well, the Ottomans started all of that. And uh, of course, as well as the, the dishes that they initiated, like uh, things like yogurt and, and, and hummus, all these dips and uh, massive um, in the use of fruit and nuts uh, in, in, in lots of dishes and fresh ingredients. Where coffee was the big um, beverage that they, they introduced. Um, it had already come obviously from Yemen in Mocha and found its way um, into Syria and then into Istanbul. And Suleiman the Magnificent was, it was a huge fan and a whole industry developed around coffee drinking. So. At, at the top coffee palace, there was the chief coffee maker. At the um, the ceramic kilns at uh, Iznik and Kutahia, they they made beautiful coffee cups, and the culture then obviously found its way into um, into Europe. And uh, so here, this is actually an Ottoman restaurant in in Sarajevo in the Balkans, where they still have Ottoman cuisine, and you even um, eat it off Ottoman. Art, you know, um, copper, copperware, and uh, special, special cutlery, everything from from the Ottoman era. Uh, Sarajevo is often referred to as the Jerusalem of Europe um, because of this this idea of uh, the the different cultures, where you have the mosque, the synagogue, and the church all on the same main square and all in use. And uh, so, at the, the coffee, and interestingly. Um, after the, uh, the failed second siege of Vienna, where the Ottoman uh, army had to abandon all their stocks, um, uh, and that's where coffee, incidentally, uh, was, was first discovered, um, because an, an Ottoman, uh, um, uh, I think he was Polish, actually, a Polish um, a soldier who'd been an Ottoman prisoner for a couple of years, recognized the coffee beans and knew what to do with them, and nobody else had a clue what to do with them. And he, he developed, um, gave Vienna then a taste for coffee, which is of course still drunk in the Ottoman way in Vienna with a glass of water accompanying it. Um, the Ottoman army also abandoned their instruments. And so many musical instruments came into Europe through uh, uh, what, was, what was left there by, by the army. And uh, water systems is another big uh, legacy. So, uh, when, when uh, Constantinople was conquered, one of the first things that uh, the Ottomans did was to improve the water system. And uh, uh, later, of course, Sinan, the great court architect, um, was, was the water engineer before he became the court architect. And he built aqueducts that brought water into Istanbul from the Belgrade forest to the north. And the um, Every, every important person would bequeath a public drinking fountain um, so that everybody in the city would have um, clean water. And on the right there is Sinan's own drinking fountain that he bequeathed uh, after, after his death. 
And here we have the Suleymaniye Mosque in, 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 uh, in Istanbul, which is uh, one of Sinan's great, greatest creations. And I wanted to show you this in order to explain what, a, in, what an environmentalist Sinan was. I mean, the, the whole, I mean, we could learn so much from this, but it was designed, he designed the dome in such a way that all the soot from the candles and the oil lamps was channeled up into a filter room where it was passed through water, which turned it into ink. And that very high quality ink was then used in calligraphy and manuscripts, and it had special insect repellent qualities. So that, that really is incredible, the sort of 16th century recycling flair that um, I'm sure we could learn a lot from. This is uh, talking of calligraphy, what the, the signature of, of the Sultan, each one had his own uh, special uh, Torah, as they were called. And all the Sultans wrote poetry themselves. And there are examples of the poetry in, in the book uh, throughout. I mean, I think it's actually very, very interesting to see exactly what they wrote. And they wrote rhyming, um, rhyming poems, a bit like, a bit like sonnets. Uh, and so, uh, one of the other areas that they um, very unusual is is their love of animals, and again, I think this goes back to their, their nomadic origins, where you had to live alongside nature. You 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 couldn't exploit it, otherwise you'd be destroying yourself. Again, very relevant for today. Um, so one of the things they really understood was that you had to look after. Um, the animal kingdom. And so birds were, were something that they very much focused on. So on the walls of palaces and mosques and caravanserais, you will find astonishing bird houses like these bird palaces. And they, um, they, they set up the first uh, animal hospital way, way ahead of Europe um, to, to look after storks that had had their wings broken I mean, a completely different kind of philosophy. And uh, here we have in, in the Balkans again, this is near Mostar in, in Bosnia, uh, a Bektashi Teke. So this is a kind of Sufi lodge. And it's important to understand that the Ottomans right from the very beginning, starting with Osman, always had a Sufi uh, spiritual guide alongside them, who, who would also fight alongside them, uh, as indeed did their women, by the way. The women were very much part of this scene. I mean, they, they would, the women would fight on horseback with babies strapped to their backs um, and were incredibly economically active too in making the, the, the carpets and very much part of society right from the start with huge respect, which uh, again is something people don't, don't expect. So still in the Balkans now, we have many examples of, of relics, if you like, of Ottoman culture that um, and are very little known. So in, in North Macedonia, there's a, a place called Tetovo, which has this astonishing painted mosque uh, in a sort of slightly Baroque style of a very interesting blend of European Baroque and uh, sort of Ottoman Rococo styles, but unlike, unlike anything else. And uh, still in Bosnia, we have um, the, the bridge of, of Mostar, uh, which was destroyed, of course, in, in the communal fighting, and it, because it linked the Christian and the, the Muslim sides of, of the river. And so it was, it was a, a, an act of cultural destruction, um, knowing, I mean, it was, it was a sort of destruction of memory, really. They wanted to eradicate um, in the Balkan War any, any uh, relic of the fact that these communities had actually uh, lived alongside each other. So the, the bridge has been rebuilt. And again, this, this is a, a bridge built by a, a student of Sinan, uh, although later Western travel writers often refer to it as a Roman bridge. It was much too, much too beautiful to have been built by, by an Ottoman, so they just assumed it must have been Roman. And here's another bridge. This one is by, by Sinan, built over the river Drina, uh, which is uh, famous because of the book that was written, The Bridge Over the Drina, uh, which, um, which won, won the author, Ivo Andrich, the Nobel, um, Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, and again, during the Balkan War, um, you know, 
hundreds if not thousands of people were, were thrown off the bridge and um, the, the owner of the hydroelectric um, dam down river complained that the bodies were, were clogging up his, his turbines. And after the war was over and DNA was taken from, from the area and they, they showed that the, the range of the, the age range of the victims was from two to 93. Uh, so horrific, uh, horrific episodes of, uh, of destruction that took place in the Balkans there. Uh, so now health is another area that you don't expect the Ottomans to be associated with, but they were the world leaders in vaccination. They began the practice of vaccination against smallpox. So in this stamp on the left, uh, it's commemorating the 300 year anniversary of the first smallpox vaccination um, in 1717. And you can see there that it's administered by a woman to a child inside a Turkish bath. That's, that is how it was done. And, and it was uh, brought then to, uh, to England by the British ambassador's wife. And uh, she met with a very skeptical community, but she did it on her own son and eventually persuaded various relations of hers to do it. And again, the, the British medical profession was, was extremely skeptical and started off trying it out on prisoners but then once it was shown to be successful, of course, it was the, the royalties and, and the elites that, that made sure they got vaccinated first. Whereas in, in, in the Ottoman times, even, even back then, the, the Sultan insisted that everybody had to be vaccinated, um, free of charge, absolutely everybody, including you know, new refugees. People were not allowed to attend school unless they'd been vaccinated. They were very um, advanced on, on all of this. And public hygiene was massively important to them. So they had public toilets all across Constantinople at a time when, when Europe, Europeans thought it was purer not to bathe at all. And, and um, the baths on the right there are in Bulgaria and still, still functioning. And plagues. Now, this is something, again, that during the Ottoman 600-year rule they they had of course the the black death um in the 14th century uh but there were many plagues that they had to um administer and and try to control and they really did their best to they understood they about mask wearing and quarantine so here is a quarantine center that they set up this one happens to be um in hebron in in, in the occupied west bank um with ships that were coming into Istanbul, they, they had quarantine stations all, um, all along the Dardanelles just uh, so that people couldn't come into to Istanbul until they were certain that they were clear of any form of plague. So they, they, were, um, they took their responsibilities extremely seriously in, in all these areas. Now, um, still in the Balkans here, we have um, in, in, in what is today Albania, we have two uh, relics of Ottoman cities as they would have looked. We have Berat and, and Girokast, as they're called. Um, and they give an example of, of again, this Ottoman urban uh, sort of lifestyle that they, the way they chose to build their communities where all the, the houses tended to be on the hillsides so that everybody had a view. There was better air circulation. There was better drainage, and um, all these things had been had been thought through. And the interiors are really like um, still still quite like um, a tent uh, concept in in the sense that the rooms were versatile. The rooms could be changed from a living room to a sleeping room, um, and everything was just put away in cupboards. So it was an incredibly versatile space that they that they had. And then this, uh, this again in, in, the, in the war, um, the First World War, this is again to do with the refugees. So these um, were refugees that were fleeing, um, fleeing Russia and they, um, uh, they were, I mean, in, in the displacement, uh, 800,000 Circassians were, were displaced and, and forced um, to, to be taken in by the Ottomans, who, who, who had a, a refugee code um, remarkably early. I mean, the proper code setting out exactly how all refugees had to be treated, 
um, in, a, in a remarkably egalitarian way. And, and this, this continued right up to the end, right up to, you know, here, here we're looking at, you know, in, in, in uh, after the, the Russian Revolution, I mean, you know, huge, um, we're talking literally within a few years of the end, they were still taking in huge numbers of refugees. And, and uh, I mean, just a, the final example of this, the, the great Irish famine in the 19th century, that the Sultan um, wanted to help, offered to, to give 10,000 um, pounds to, to Ireland, and Queen Victoria intervened and asked him not to give so much because she was only going to give uh, one or 2,000, I think it was. So he had to reduce the amount he gave in order to not show her up, but in fact then sent um, many, many more ships laden with food. And, and a film is actually being made about this, a film called Fabin, uh, which is in, um, in production at the moment and will hopefully hit cinemas um, very soon. And so that's, uh, that's basically it. And uh, yes, so just, just to say, it's a vast subject, very, very complex, obviously. And I just tried to give a sort of flavor and an overview of all the things that, you know, obviously the more positive aspects of, of, of things. So, um, so that people understand how much Ottomans did influence their life, you know, so that, so that um, you know, I joke that when you, when you eat your yogurt, you know, when you relax on your sofa and when you reach for your towel, remember that the Ottomans were behind all of that. Um, thank you, Diana, for this uh, presentation. Uh, let me ask you a few questions as we wait for questions from the audience. Let me again remind that you can use the Q&A function of the Zoom to uh, send us your questions and I will uh, direct them to Diana. So my first question is this. Uh, your book puts the focus on cultural life in the Ottoman Empire. You curate for us an exceptional array of information from astronomy to puppet theaters, from practices of inoculation to music, from cartography to cuisine. Um, your book is captivating and lively um, and focuses mostly on the relatively peaceful aspects of conviviality and coexistence. Uh, but like all empires, the story of the Ottoman Empire is also one of conflict, conquest, oppression, mass uh, atrocities and bloodshed. Um, just to give one example, um, as the Ottoman Empire was welcoming refugees uh, from Russia, that was the Armenian genocide was taking place concomitantly at the same time. Uh, can you tell me about what has driven you to focus on coexistence rather than conflict and hostil hostilities? Well, because as I mentioned at the outset, I think there's been an overfocus on the conflict, on the ugly side of the Ottomans, especially the, the final bloody decades, as I mentioned. And, and I just feel that this is, um, you know, gives gives an unfair ref an impression, you know, the terrible Turk, the sick man of Europe, all of these things that I, as a child, you know, was taught at school. And, and I feel that, um, you know, having having travelled extensively um, across the region, uh, I just feel that there's a there, there's a lot uh, of of posit positive things there that we we can learn about, uh, especially this um, this idea that, that that they began with of a sort of egalitarian society and a building. Um, I mean, the fact that UNESCO even recognises it as a sort of model of urban planning. Uh, I think, you know, should be known about because we, we, we can learn ways of doing that. And I think city centres, you know, need to have community hubs there where, where, where services um, exist and, and um, you know, housing was provided uh, for, for everybody and services provided for everybody. Um, in, in other words, the complete opposite of somewhere like Dubai, for example, where, where you know, the things that get built are for the elites, for the rich, um, you know, the poor, who cares about the poor? They can go and live in some hovel somewhere, you know, we don't care as long as we've got our, our amazing, um, you know, penthouses and uh, villas and everything. I mean, the, the Ottoman approach was not like that. They, they um, it was different. And yes, of course, and not for one second whitewashing Horrific things that happened. I mean, every every empire is guilty of all, uh, you know, so many atrocities. There are good and bad in all these things. So, I mean, I don't. I'm not attempting to um, 
to whitewash any of that. It's just not the focus of the book. Um, uh, let me actually ask you, you have lived in the lands once uh, were parts of the Ottoman Empire for many years, including Lebanon, Egypt and Syria, and traveled extensively in the region. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how your own interaction uh, with the Ottoman lands affected your perspective in this book? Well, um, I think the whole, uh, I mean, ever since I first traveled in the region, uh, which is, you know, back in the 70s, I was very struck by how different um, people were. I mean, um, again, contrary to expectation, because again, you know, I mean, my mother's German, I was brought up in, within European confines, if you like, um, and anything east of Greece was kind of, well, my goodness, you know, a sort of, you drop off the end of a precipice at the end of Greece, you know. <laughs> nobody, nobody went there, nobody knew anything about it. So it was only when I switched to Arabic and I made a conscious decision at university to switch from German and philosophy to Arabic um, that I began to realize, my goodness, you know, so much has, uh, you know, really, even, you know, the Greeks learnt huge amounts from everything further east. So even the Greek um, gable, for instance, you know, which we think of as the ultimate Greek thing, is I learnt, you know, had, when I saw it for myself, it actually came from the Urartians in, in, in Anatolia. And so everything sort of passed uh, westwards and, and then sort of somehow became European and, and nobody... Uh, Nobody bothered to look further than that, but 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 beyond all of that, it was actually the 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 way that people welcomed you actually, and and um, I mean you know I was a a blonde girl in my twenties driving around in a car on my own. Um, you know you might think that would be problematic, but it never ever was. I was treated with enormous respect. Um, in hospitality, you know, when the car broke down, as it regularly did, I would, people would come and help fix it for me. And um, it, was, it was an astonishing um, sense of hospitality, of welcoming, if you like. And, and when, I, when I took the decision to buy, you know, my house in, in Damascus and to restore it over a three year period again, you know, it was the way I wasn't regarded as some sort of weird foreigner who was just, um, uh, you know, slightly, slightly insane. Um, I was welcomed. I mean, people understood that I, I liked the society. I enjoyed the place. I cared about the cultural heritage, and and they helped me from from the word go, really, and and never questioned my motives. They never they realised that it was nothing to do with um, money. I wasn't looking to make a profit out of anything. You know, it was done out of a genuine concern for for the country and, and its cultural heritage. And, and some of the closest friendships, I think, um, you know, that I made across my life, I, I've made in that part of the world with unlikely people, people you might think I might not have much in common with, but um, the sense of welcome and acceptance um, of everybody, irrespective of hierarchy. I mean, I mean there's a kind of an absence of hierarchy and I, and I I, I uh, maybe when I come back, to, you know, when, whenever I come back to Europe, I see that hierarchy everywhere again. <laughs> I realize, my goodness, yes, this is what I prefer <laughs> um, when I'm not in Europe is, is this, this sense of everybody relates to you on a human level, not on, you know, your status or anything like that. Um, my, um, let me also comment um one aspect of your book that I really admired. I am an art and architectural historian, and this is one of the most beautiful books, book covers I've ever seen. And it includes uh, 149 illustrations, all of which complement um, perfectly the narrative of the book. Can you tell me a little bit about um, your process of selecting these images? Uh, what was your kind of like um, archival research, what were some of the fun things that you did when you were collecting yeah. these images? Oh, it's great. Yes, it's, it's wonderful um, being able to, to, to do that sort of thing. I mean, it, it, is, it is terrific. Um, and I'm, I'm very visual. I, I have to see things. And when I'm writing, I immediately um, 
you know, I look for images, even as I'm writing, I think, oh, you know, this needs to have an illustration. So I do, I do a quick search around. I mean, sometimes I've got photos of my own. Normally they're not good enough <laughs> to be used in a book of this sort, but, um, but they give me an idea. And so I then insert in the text um, where I found things and I add things in. And um, Thames and Hudson provided me then with a photo researcher. So I put in what I had thought needed to be illustrated. And she then went off and found a whole range of things because of course she had access to um, things that you, you, know, you need to get behind paywalls for and all that kind of thing, which I, which I obviously didn't. So, um, so, but it's huge fun, yes. And then, and so she compiled um, a list of um, a whole, whole gamut of things that we then went through, the, the editor and I went through together and agreed on what we would select. And so um, it has been beautifully put together. Um, and I'm I like, you know, as you said, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very proud of that. I think it is, it is a, genuine, um, a genuine reflection of everything, you know, that the Ottomans did do extremely well. And, and it's good that it's there, you know, in colour, in glorious Technicolor to, uh, for everybody to see. So I have a question from our, our audience. Um, and uh, they say, excellent presentation. Do you have any ideas on how Western attitudes to the Ottomans and today's Turkey and countries from that empire can change away from the prejudiced view towards a more historically realistic, they put it in um, quotation marks, and a positive one? Yeah, well, this is really all about the education system. And uh, one of the things I, I learned um, in my researches was in the Balkans, especially, um, the education system, that what children are taught at school about the Ottomans is truly um, <laughs> unbelievable. You know, it sort of covers something like, you know, barely two lessons in the entire syllabus is, is on the Ottomans and is giving a very negative perspective. And, and, and of course, that does colour the, the whole view of, of, of younger generations. And I think that has to change. That um, but how do you make that change? Well, that, that's, that this is where, you know, obviously one of the motivations of writing the book is to try to open people's eyes to a different way of looking at the Ottomans so that um, their cultural heritage can be more appreciated and, and put in perspective. Because as I said, these things are not black and white. And you do need to, um, you do need to to understand the nuances. And, and I think it's important to, um, to learn from what they got right. And, and they did get quite a lot right. I mean, you don't, you don't survive for 600 years without getting some things right. <laughs> Actually, our next question um, is somewhat related to your answer. And um, our audience asked, do you think that curricula in the West, in architecture and art, for example, uh, is getting better at representing the contributions of the Saracens. And I guess they also meant Ottomans as well. Ottomans, yes, yes. Yes, well, well, in, in the Stealing from the Saracens book, there is a whole chapter about the Ottoman architecture and the relationship between Sinan and Christopher Wren. Um, uh, and, and, I mean, again, you know, one of, the, one of the main reasons I wrote that book was to try to point out um, how much we have learnt uh, and from Islamic culture and, and especially understanding of geometry and vaulting styles, all, all of these things are, are terrifically important. And I mean, not a single Gothic cathedral would have been built, but for the knowledge of geometry and vaulting techniques, which had come in to Europe from Islamic cultures via, via Muslim Spain, via Sicily, and via Italian trading ports, you know, who, who brought who brought in craftsmen indeed, and and learnt then from the craftsmen and the masons, um, you know, all of these skills were then gradually passed over to Europeans. And I think, you know, really in Europe, education curricula ought to begin to acknowledge this. And and you can't deny the evidence because the evidence is the buildings themselves. The proof is there, you know, in in the buildings, and everybody. Who looks at things like Gothic cathedrals? You know, they didn't just miraculously pop out like some virgin birth. You know, they <laughs> there is a massive backstory. You need huge skills to be able to build something of that sort. And um, stonemasons and and engineers who've studied it um, say that there was this 
you know, it's it's kind of obvious that there's this there was this massive step change in the early medieval period. How come suddenly things like that were able to be built? Well, you know, in architecture, things move very, very slowly. You know, even the one degree of the pointedness of the arch, you know, takes more than 30 years to, to, to change. So everything does happen very, very slowly. So you do have to, um, uh, uh, you know, take, take all this, um, take all this, uh, on board and and uh you know I, I i do think eventually eventually i mean you've got to start somewhere <laughs> this is my is my logic and at least you know by by highlighting these things you 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 start to make people think differently about it and it takes obviously many years for things to to change in, in curricula but i am hopeful that um you know i get a lot of i get a lot of people contacting me via my website saying Thank you for making me realize finally how much um, you know you're making me see it through different eyes now because I understand about the pointed arch and the structural benefits that that brought and uh, all of these things you know it's important to understand that because these these are you know, things like cathedrals they they represent so much in our in our lives in in Europe you know their 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 history their geography their politics their you know they're, they're, they're everything rolled into one in, in, in my view they they are um, astonishing buildings that um, need to be fully understood instead of just looking at them superficially and thinking oh yes that's a beautiful french french gothic cathedral built entirely by frenchmen and, and only the french could have done that which is completely wrong <laughs> in my view um our next question um next uh, next audience question is this what are your thoughts concerning how the ottoman legacy has shaped the current peoples in the middle east do you believe that the complex ethnicities and religions in for example jordan still resonate from the heavy ottoman influence or um, are in the population's dna uh, more like socio-psychological mindsets and um, other peoples like the circassians and the chechens well, yes, I, I do actually think that, that the Ottoman legacy can be seen in that. Um, and uh, again, it's one of the things I like very much about, about the, the, the Levant, you know, to use the Western terminology of it, you know, the Eastern Mediterranean, all of, all of those lands that were part of um, the, the Ottoman Empire, I think have, have kept uh, a, lot of, a lot of that mindset and a lot of that approach. Um, and it still shows today, I think, in in um, in the way that Syrian refugees, for example, were taken in by neighbouring countries um, initially, even even though, of course, it's now led to huge problems both in Turkey and in Lebanon. And uh, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, but initially, the response of the both the governments and and local people was to welcome refugees, as opposed to. The European mindset was keep them out of here at, at all costs. We don't want them, you know. <laughs> such a different outlook, such a completely different way of, of, of looking at it. So um, I, I, I feel that, I mean, when I was in uh, Damascus, just to give an example, um, when I was there for quite a long time, this was in 2006, and um, it was in the middle of restoring um, my, my house there. And it, the this war um, blew up between uh, Israel and Lebanon suddenly that in that summer of 2006. And my architect and some of his friends um, were driving off to the border, to the Lebanese border, and collecting refugees from the border and bringing them back and, and putting them up in their homes. And, and I said to him, you know, why are you doing that? You know, do you know these people or something? You know, and, and he said, no, no, I don't know them, but you know, they, they've, they're they're stuck in the middle of a war they obviously need help so we're just going to help them out and, and you know and we'll open up our schools and things and they can sleep in in you know any every any we'll we'll bring them whatever they need and and then when it's all over they'll go back again and i was just flabbergasted that they were prepared to do this for total strangers the government wasn't involved on, on these these were individual acts of, of kindness and I, I don't think you'd see that. Um, I, I feel I feel it's not really like that in Europe anymore. Uh, I think it's it's uh, we've we've kind of we've kind of lost that that ability. And I was um, I was deeply moved by that and and the um, 
the, the, the humanity, as I said, the relating to people sort of human to human, that, uh, that they still, well, it, it's still in evidence in, in, in my view, even though it's come at a huge cost to the, the governments now who are struggling, obviously, with a huge burden of refugees, because, it, you know, here in, here in the UK, we, we fuss about, you know, a few thousand coming across the channel in rubber boats, whereas, you know, Turkey, Lebanon and, and uh, Jordan have taken in millions, millions, you know, and are much tinier countries with, with much uh, sort of, you know, weaker infrastructures. So, uh, you know, I think, especially as, as populations change and as climate change, makes more refugees. I mean, uh, something major has to has to change basically in the in the outlook of of the way the way the sort of westernized Europeanized world sees things. And um, it, you know, nothing nothing changes overnight, but you have to start somewhere. Um, I think we have um, only a few minutes left, and I'm just going to ask the last question that um, came to me. Um, the, the question says, if I didn't mishear, you said that Turkey is the second largest country that hosts Jews after Israel. I think you meant um, Sephardic Jews, right? Yes, yes, and I think I was only talking about Istanbul as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, they say, why do you think the Jewish community have decided to stay in a Muslim majority country? Do you believe that the Ottoman culture play a role in their decision? Well, yes. I mean, I mean, they they were quite clear about that. I mean, I mean, at the time of the Reconquista, you know, Jewish or Jewish rabbis. I mean, I quote it in the book. You know how he he encourages Jews to come and says, you know, come here because here you will be encouraged to, to uh, you know, you, you will be given all the support that you need and um, you will be welcomed. And uh, interestingly, you know, uh, back to architecture again, uh, very often the Jewish choice of um, architecture uh, was essentially Islamic architecture. I mean, if you look at the new synagogue in Berlin, for example, I mean, it is a sort of, neo-Moorish style. So it's as if, as if they, in, in Cordoba, for example, you know, the synagogue in Cordoba is, you look at it and, and you'd, you'd be hard pushed to sort of, you know, you have to be told almost that this is a, this is a synagogue and not a mosque. And um, because, because the, the styles, the patterns are the same. And, and this is from choice, obviously. They, they, um, they, they, um, they felt comfortable in, in that environment and, uh, you know, and, and very much responded to it. Um, so um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Diane, uh, for joining us uh, today. Um, and I'd like to congratulate you again for the publication of the Ottomans. Uh, before we leave, uh, let me remind you that a recording of this event will be avail available on the Middle East Institute's website and YouTube. And thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful week.